Um, so, as, um, as you just said, I'm from the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Um, and they told me to make my slides very simple, so maybe I took that too far. But basically, what I wanted to point out is that the pub study of public health, which is the field that I'm trained in, is not the study of the health of individuals, but the health of populations. And in the way that those things behave, it's actually quite different. So we've heard a lot about how viruses behave and how um, a lot of other th things, but the study of populations is quite different. And to me, that's special for two reasons. The first is that, well, you should know that if you are sick, I'm probably not the person to ask, even though I have a doctorate in, in health. Um, but then secondly, I think it's quite interesting because this means that what we study has to do with looking at how things really happen when you add in all of the factors beyond the individual, such as the social factors, environmental factors, and economic factors that also have to do with whether something works or not to uh, in control of the spread of disease. And so as a social epidemiologist, um, I study often uh, differences between populations, and so this one, this is a, as an example, um, this is the, a graph of the differences in infant mortality by country. Um, and we often study these things using these complicated statistical procedures, but I won't bore you with those things today. Um, but while this shows us that there is a lot of difference in the, in the level of infant mortality by country, it doesn't really tell us why that is. Sometimes we also look at inequalities within population. And so for example, this is a graph showing the differences in life expectancy by race and by gender in the United States. And so this may tell us a little bit more about the patterns of uh, health within populations, but again, it doesn't get at why, why this is the case. Uh, and these things, we see similar patterns here in Spain. Um, these are some graphs of different um, chronic diseases by education, and so you can see a general pattern, which is that people with lower levels of, of education tend to have higher levels of chronic disease. And then here again, by, um, by job classification, the general trend shows that those with higher level jobs um, are those that have better health. And so um, these, these types of inequalities we often see, or we've heard talked about a lot within the COVID pandemic. Um, and so for example, there have been, there have been a lot of um, talk about how frontline workers, front line, who, people who work in frontline jobs, which are often filled by women, people of, of color, um, and other people who have lower wages but who are essential, such as um, bus drivers, grocery store workers, and, and um, care workers in nursing homes and hospitals who have direct patient care and therefore are put at greater risk. And so we can think about these things logically, and we can understand why um, people in these job classifications, uh, who also are those maybe with lower levels of education, who are also perhaps those with um, lower wages, are put at greater risk for, um, for worse health. And so this might be um, also uh, part of the reason. So this is just another, uh, another demonstration. From, this is graph is from early in the pandemic sometime in the spring of 2020. Um, and it shows the predicted versus actual hospitalization for COVID by, um, by race and ethnicity in the UK. And so here, the important thing is to, sh to see exact the, the extent of how extreme the pandemic, early on at least, affected the Black Caribbean population. Um, so in sum, uh, health equity, which is what I focus on, <laughs> looks at the differences in health outcomes between and within populations. Um, but specifically, it talks about not just the differences, but we frame those differences as being unjust and unfair. Um, and so, so the fact that poor and minority people, for example, are more exposed to toxic waste, air pollution, uh, 
um, flooding and other climate-related risks is an example of how those, those uh, outcomes become uh, different. And so we, we further analyze these unjust and unfair differences by thinking about all of the things that, that lead to them. And we, we do this thinking about not just uh, people's individual characteristics, such as their genetics, um, but also their interpersonal environment, who they relate to, who their family is, where they live, uh, the types of organizations they belong to, the populations they belong to, um, and also the types of physical and social environments that they're exposed to. And, and these types of differences, so far I, I was just showing you some, some data, but they, they can also be, be seen spatially. And if you have, have never seen this, um, this map, probably if any of you went to public health school, you would have seen this map. Um, this is a map that is a repl replication of a map made in 1854 by John Snow, who's often credited as being the first epidemiologist. Um, and it's a map uh, where he documented uh, cases in a cholera outbreak. Um, and so, as the story goes, he interviewed all the families that were affected in this neighborhood and came to the conclusion that the, um, the cholera outbreak was associated with using water from a specific pump. Um, and supposedly he went to the pump and he took the handle off to prevent people from using it and soon thereafter the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the outbreak um, stopped. So we don't actually know if Jon Snow stopped the, that outbreak or if it was coming to an end anyway. Um, but the, the important thing is that he, he did all this not knowing what caused cholera. In 1854, this was before uh, germ theory had come about. It was before anyone had, had identified the actual bacteria that does cause cholera. But the outcome was the same, and it could be very, very, very well that he did uh, cease the, the outbreak. Um, in addition to that, he did this before the development of modern statistics, which we use now to, um, to think, to understand how things spread. Uh, so in the same way, um, using these finer scale maps like Jon Snow used to uh, solve this, this problem might be more useful also in thinking about uh, COVID and COVID vaccines. So this is not a fine scale map, but if this is a map of, um, of COVID cases from, from May of 2020, and so we can think about, you know, it clearly shows that there's differences in, in countries in terms of the number of cases reported per, per, per 100,000 people. Um, but if we think about what's behind this map, we can, uh, there's a number of things that might show us. It might show us which countries had more effective policies and measures to control the pandemic, such as the strict lockdowns in China or the extreme measures to track people in South Korea. Um, it also might show us which countries had m more available testing at this time in the pandemic. Um, or it might even show us which countries were more intimately involved in global trade. If we look at another map, this one is more recent, and it shows the doses per 100,000 people of vaccines distributed around the world by country. And so similarly, this might show us which countries have been able to acquire enough vaccines to distribute to their population. Um, and it might also show us where people are willing to get the vaccine and where there's less hesitancy to being vaccinated. If we look at the same map from, um, from February 2021, um, it looks very different. And what we do see is that there's a couple of countries, specifically uh, the United States and Israel and the UK, um, which look to be ahead of even other wealthy countries in distributing the vaccine. But what, we've, what, I, what we're wondering is, could we have predicted that this map would come to look like the other one, and why? Um, so our project aims to understand from a political ecology economy perspective uh, and using a multi-scaler uh, uh, analysis, how, um, 
how these broad decisions and strategies for vaccine acquisition and distribution at the country, regional, and local level have resulted in finite geographic and social differences in vaccine dis uh, coverage. So we think that this is important because we have to know how the vaccine works in the real world with limitations. And that means understanding the conditions in cities and countries and beyond. It's important to track uh, coverage at the country level, but also to know what's happening at the at a very local scale, which is at the end of the day, the way most people experience their daily lives. Um, and so we think that this addresses some of the gaps, although research, of course, in this area is uh, because of the acu acuteness of the situation, it's growing rapidly. But in general, what you see in the research today that's coming out about vaccines has to do with either the ethical, like ethical analyses of um, vaccine distribution on a global scale or tracking uh, vaccine rollout progress within and between countries and within cities. Um, and then some research also that gets at the interpersonal or psychosocial barriers to, va to vaccine acceptance. So those are things like lack of access um, due to migra migration status or lack of knowledge or many other things, um, level of he hesitancy, uh, or perhaps comorbidities that prevent people from being able to get vaccinated. So these are some data from the um, Center for Sociological Research uh, that came out just a few days ago, and they show some of these things. And so what they, they have shown, for example, that um, interestingly, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference in those not getting vaccinated in Spain, at least, between uh, rural versus urban areas or between different sizes of municipalities. Um, but there does seem to be a difference in who's getting vaccinated by uh, social class and level of education and by age. And they also looked at some interesting things like what, what does politics have to do with it? So they looked at um, uh, the number of people, or the, the, the differences in um, in political ideology among those who were not getting vaccinated. And then uh, perhaps even more actionable, they looked at um, the reasons why people reported not getting vaccinated. And so you see at the top, uh, the, the most common one was that they didn't trust vaccines. <clears throat> so um, we can also look at these trends spatially, and if we look at a finite scale again, so some, something sort of similar to what John Snow saw in 1840, uh, 1854, um, we have a map like this. So this is a map of New York City, and it shows the um, percentage of residents in each zip code that are fully vaccinated. And so in a country like um, New York, we saw in the early map of uh, vaccine distribution that the US was one that because of its um, relative uh, tolerance for risk and for debt, um, they actually purchased a lot of vaccines before the vaccine was developed. And then they used public-private -pri partnerships uh, to distribute the vaccine. And so they were basically getting um, privately owned pharmacies and also healthcare facilities, which in the US are, are largely privately owned and often even for profit, to distribute the vaccines to people at a local level. New York City specifically also has a fairly robust public health department, which was also involved in distributing the vaccine. So with all that in favor of getting the vaccine out to the people, it seems interesting that we still see this level of uh, inequality between neighborhoods in New York City. And so some of, these, the, the, some of the things that might contribute to this pattern have to do with things that we already knew about uh, existing social and health inequalities in New York City. And so these, some of these lighter colored neighborhoods are neighborhoods where there were already a lot of poor and minority residents who may not have access to general health care due to uh, high cost and lack of health insurance which often prevents people in the United States from accessing care and may make them also less familiar with uh, how to get the vaccine. Um, and then there's also some special populations that the city is very aware of, specifically um, the Hasidic Jewish population. You can see some neighborhoods 
um, where there are a lot of Hasidic uh, Jewish communities, which have which is a community that's known to be uh, resistant to the vaccine, not just for COVID, but for other illnesses as well. So if we look also at a different, a different map, this one is Barcelona, um, but we see a similar pattern. And this is also, if we think about uh, it from a, a larger scale, in Spain, we have a, a very different healthcare system. That is, we have a uh, complete public health system that, that is um, distributed at the neighborhood level in general. And in addition to that, everyone in Spain should theoretically have access to health care because even undocumented immigrants have access to this public system. Um, and so although the rollout of the vaccine in Spain was slower than the, in the US, if you look at the data today, you see that at least among the higher uh, age range, over 95% of people are fully vaccinated. Um, and so it's interesting to see in a city like Barcelona why there should be such a variation in the, the overall level of vaccine um, coverage. Um, so those are some of the questions that we're considering. Unfortunately, I don't have any answers for you because we haven't done this project yet. But the plan is to do a uh, multi-scalar project that uses two types of data. So first, what we would do is a quantitative study using uh, publicly accessible data at, the, at, a, at a small geographic scale and comparing three cities, New York City, London, and Barcelona. We chose those cities because one, they had available data at a, at a small geographic scale, and two, because they are in countries that have very, had very different tra trajectories and policies in terms of how they acquired and distributed the vaccine at the local level. Um, and you can see the sources and the, and the type of data that we have available. Uh, and we also plan to do a, a qual qualitative interview, which would include uh, a qualitative study, which would include interviews with decision makers and residents that would help us to understand what structural barriers exist um, other than vaccine, vaccine hesitancy and why we might see these patterns. Um, so this is also hopefully an international collaboration. So in addition to, to ICTA, we have um, a collaborator from the Center for Demographic Studies from our same institution, um, also from the Public Health Agency of Barcelona and from University College London. Um, and I think that this is also uh, really important to point out that we all come from different disciplines, which is a really important pro uh, part of Diagnose, uh, sort of dissecting and thinking about the, this problem from different angles. Thank you.